Welcome to the System Simplified Podcast, where we feature top leaders who share stories on how to successfully systemize a business. Now, let's get started with the show. Hello, Andy Clevitt here, the host of the System Simplified Podcast, where we interview top founders, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders about systematizing a business. And this podcast is being brought to you by Business Success Consulting Group, where we create, document, and implement processes and procedures so businesses can grow and thrive. And today's guest is Carl Meyer. Hi, Carl. Hi, Adi. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Very good. Very good. Excited to be here. Yes, I'm glad to have you here. We're going to talk today about a subject that I'm sure is very, I mean, I know it's relevant and I'm sure our listeners are going to be very interested in, which has to do with how to seize opportunities in an economic chaos, right? It's like how to actually be able to, um, how to improve your profit, how to seize the opportunity, how to do well despite the economic chaos. And But let me introduce you correctly first. So you are the author of Surfing Economy, Surfing Economic Chaos. And um, you speak to companies and groups, and um, you are also offer you offer um, profit improvement workshops, CEO peer advisory roundtable groups to basically help companies grow and profit. So I first of all want to uh, um, give a big shout out to Steve Thornton from Apex Management Partners that introduced us. Yes, Steve, uh, d- he does a great job. I uh, enjoy working with him. He and I have done a lot of things together, both promoting our uh, services and also uh, working together on some things. So, Absolutely. So thank you, Steve, for that introduction. And Carl, what we have in common... We have a lot of things in common, but some of the things we have in common is that, you know, we want to work with companies so they can grow and profit, right? We do it from different angles. I do it in terms of increasing their efficiency, processes, procedures, and you do it in terms of the improvement in the profit and how to actually seize opportunities during times that you can do that. So before we dive into your book and what you do, give us a little bit more of a background about yourself and how did you how did you get into the position where you wrote that book? Mm -hmm. Part of the background that helped me write the book was my economics that uh, study at university. And that helped me keep up with the economic situation over the years. And it's really given me some perspectives on understanding what's going on in the world right now. And so some really interesting trends that have picked up in the world and having worked in both big companies, small companies, startups in a variety of roles has really given me a broad perspective to look for these trends and find these opportunities. Great. So let's talk about your book. What inspired you to write that book? Well, there's always noise. There's always stuff going on. We read about it in the the newspapers. Well, the internet these days. But what I saw about a year ago was some fundamental trends, some really deep trends, multi-decade long trends that are really causing a change in the way the world works. And to me, that was really noteworthy. It wasn't something that it just jumped out at me. And I thought that was worth sharing. And I also saw how that could present some really big opportunities for companies who are able to take advantage of that. Absolutely. So let's talk about that. What are some of the trends that you've seen? Two of the really big trends are the aging of the population across the world, developed world as well as the developing world. And that has a lot of implications in terms of behaviors and societies. The other one, which is related but separate, is the changing mindset primarily of America in terms of trade and military policy. You know, the Cold War ended 30 or yeah, 30 years ago now. And 
the perspective on are we going to protect the whole world? Are we going to pay for the whole world's military protection? And how are we treating our trade relationship with the rest of the world has gradually been changing since the end of the Cold War. And those two trends together really have had some big impacts. Okay. So with those two trends, what what are the main opportunities that you see that exist out there? Well, the opportunities come out of the fact that the world is changing, the trade patterns are changing, the cost of funds are changing, and with the aging population in particular, the, the labor supply is changing. There's fewer young workers and there's those same workers are also consumers traditionally, so there's fewer consumers to buy goods. And so that's really changing the supply and demand where we manufacture things, how we ship things. So it really presents a lot of changes and change is an opportunity for a small company in particular because small companies can be nimble. They can adapt and change quickly, especially compared to a very large organization. Right, so what would you suggest to the entrepreneurs that are listening to us right now in terms of where should they look for opportunities? So there's two ways to, to look at it in my perspective. One is kind of a big picture perspective that as manufacturing, say, moves back from China to the United States, look for opportunities to find products that you can manufacture or supply from a different source. One example would be right now, if you go to just about any port in the United States, there's these big cranes that unload the container ships. All of those cranes right now were manufactured in China. If we, at some point, the United States decides that that's too big of a risk, where are we going to get those cranes from? It may be that a crane manufacturer in the United States might start manufacturing those cranes. I saw a similar example on a much smaller scale with wire coat hangers. Before the pandemic, all the wire coat hangers predominantly were made in China. At this point, there's three significant wire coat hanger manufacturers in the United States, highly automated, and they're producing the majority of the coat hangers for the United States market. So those are big picture changes. The other is to look at your business and really look at it from the bottom up, a very detailed view. Go really dig into the details of what you're selling to which customers and dig in and figure out where you're really making your profits. Worked with a company that were in the chemical industry and they were ser serving two different markets and as we looked at their products, they thought that market B, which was really uh, the, like the oil and gas sector, was where they were making all their profits. And the construction space was a place that was really just covering overhead, wasn't highly profitable. But when we really dug into the detail, we found just the opposite. They were essentially making all their profits from the construction space and they were breaking even on the, on the oil and gas side. And so really digging in deep and looking for where you're making your money can present some huge opportunities because the chemical company, for example, was then able to go back to its customers and said, hey, the supply chains have changed, the pricing has changed of our raw materials, all these things have changed, we need to raise our prices. And so they were able to bring in a lot more profits just by doing this analysis and really understanding what was going on in their business. Okay. And where would one go to actually find those opportunities? Like what do you suggest that business owners that are listening to us right now to look at the big picture and also the specific, the more of the specific picture, where would they find it? Well, on the big picture side, a lot of that is really perspective and taking a different look at the same thing that you're already used to seeing. When I work with roundtable groups, that's one of the things we work on is we bring in particular challenges that have 
company's facing and bring in a lot of different perspectives from the other roundtable members. So they're not in the same industry. And so what's in a, just an obvious assumption to somebody in the industry may be something that's questioned by another person who's experienced in business, but is not, has not been in that industry their whole life. So that's a great way to get perspective, find new opportunities, is to build a group around you that can help you with that. Absolutely. On the more detailed perspective, it's really digging into your data, you know, looking at everything from your processes, but also looking at the financial information in terms of, you know, how much am I selling to which customer? Which products am I selling to those various customers? And all that's usually buried in your accounting system. And it does take some work to dig that out. But as the example with the chemical company, it can be very valuable. It could be hundreds of thousands or in some cases, millions of dollars to the bottom line. So it's worth the effort to dig in, do that analysis and really understand where you're making your money in your business. Absolutely. All right. So in terms of um, what other advice do you um, give entrepreneurs in your book? Like anything that you would like to share in terms of uh, a process of analyzing it or making decisions or what other topics um, you think will be of interest to our audience? Well, I think the labor market is something that we're all facing these days we're you know we can just drive around town and see the help wanted signs in front of all the fast food restaurants for example and i think there's a tendency to say well that's just an aberration it's a short-term problem you know government policies or whatever is causing that but everything once we get past the pandemic and so forth it'll all come back to normal but if you really dig in and look at the numbers if you look at the labor market you've got an aging baby boom cadre which is a very large group large part of our society they're moving into retirement on average they're over 65 already and they're being replaced by a much smaller group of zoomers and when the zoomers do enter the workforce there's still such a smaller group that what that does is it shifts the supply of labor in the market. And so that means there's less labor in the market as a percent of our population. And so if you decrease supply, you're going to have to increase the cost. That's just kind of the standard economics. And so what I think people should expect is for the next decade, we're going to see high labor costs and that's going to push inflation. So that's one of the things that you know I talk about in more depth in the book and kind of talk more about the cons consequences of that impact on the labor market. Okay, so what can the average business owner can do about it? Well, using your labor as effectively as possible is certainly one part of it. And so looking at your processes, looking at how you're using labor in order to get the most out of them, make sure they're doing things that are productive. That's pretty obvious. And most companies would tend to think that's what they're doing, but I'm, I'm sure you understand that when you dig in and really look at something a little more closely, you know, intentionally look at it, you'll often find things that you wouldn't realize are there. So that's, that's one aspect. And I think that the other piece is really working hard to motivate your people. Being a good leader, being an organized manager, get, helping people understand where they fit in, where the company's going, why they're here, is you know, something that is very doable, but it takes a lot of, you know, it takes an extra amount of work to get that done. So that's another thing that I think is really valuable for, for companies. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I've interviewed several people about, and we talked about employee retention and what causes it, you know, and it's part of, it has to be part of the culture. And you're right, being organized, being efficient, 
you know, making sure that also the employees are part of it. You're creating that culture and that group where the employees are feeling that that is their group. So they don't want to leave that group, right? Because yes, it will be, there is the money motivation, but there is also the motivation of being part of something that is bigger, which we have, you know, we've seen that that, that happens and definitely uh, we had several, I had several discussions here in, in the podcast about it. And I'm sure you noticed, I mean, that's what you're talking about. So you noticed that as well. Absolutely. Yes. I think those are some of the big challenges that companies face. I think inflation has been another surprise for many companies. It's been, you know, when I was young, you know, on the older end of the the spectrum at this point, but when I was young, there was a lot of inflation in the late 80s, early 90s, there's still inflation. And for most of the last 20, 25 years, we really haven't seen inflation. And that's something that You have to plan for, you know, your pricing. You have to think about when you're doing purchasing. You have to consider that in your uh, hiring and uh, compensation policies for your employees. There's a whole lot that happens that just makes life a little more complicated. Again, in and of itself, it's not overwhelming. You know, 5 or 10% a year inflation isn't hyperinflation but it is still something that's one more thing to keep up with. So, you know, there's, there's a lot going on in the economy right now. And if you're active and, you know, adapt to these changes, there's a lot of opportunity to outperform your competition. Absolutely. So what, what would be the, if your, um, our listeners are going to pick up your book and read it, what would you like them to, what would be a big win for for you that they got out of that book? I would say understanding that the world is fundamentally changing, that it's a big change. I'd compare it to the level of impact when one power moves from, you know, like when the British were the number one country in the world and gradually the US took over that role and became the number one country in the world. I think it's that size of a change The U.S. is still going to be the number one country in the world for a long, long time. But the way we're interacting with the world is going to be so fundamentally different that it's going to have a lot of impact. So I think that in and of itself is the first major point. And the second is simply that because we're talking about some really big changes, you have to adapt in order to find your opportunities. All right. Well, that's definitely information that people should have. So, Carl, can you please um, let the listeners know how they can find you if they have any questions and where to find your book? My book is available on Amazon. So if you search for Surfing Economic Chaos, you'll find it there. And it's easy to find me on LinkedIn as well as my website at Abundant.com. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being a guest on this podcast and giving us all this valuable information. Really appreciate it. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for listening to the System Simplified Podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.